Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our session on how to manage sales performance when no one's spending. It's an unfortunate topic to be discussing because until just a few weeks ago, the economy was strong, unemployment was low, and for many of you, business was booming. And then it suddenly came to a point. The idea for this topic actually came from our last webinar on how to manage disruption. That webinar took place just a few days after offices had closed and people were beginning to work from home. We brought together HR leaders and the HR community to talk about the mass exodus from work that was happening and all the other issues we were dealing with and continue to deal with today. One of our guests in that discussion was the um, head of HR for the Atlanta Braves. And as people were asking how to manage performance and productivity, she very candidly said that in her world, people aren't buying baseball tickets right now. So there's going to be a shift in what work output looks like. Now that we've had a few weeks to adapt to living and working in crisis, I wanted to circle back to that question of performance and productivity. So to help us answer that and provide insight on how HR can partner with sales to keep the revenue engine running, we have three guests on with us today. Each of them are business leaders and sales experts, and you can see their beautiful faces on your screen. Hello, everyone. We'll get to introductions in just a moment. So again, I'd like to say thank you for being here. Um, I don't expect you to leave the session today feeling quite as zen uh, as this guy on the slide, but I do hope that by coming together, voicing concerns and sharing some insight, we can provide you with a quick breather and a place to pause, regroup and prepare for whatever tomorrow brings. I know we have a mix of people on the line today. Uh, not all of you are in sales, but as our CEO at Outmatch says, everyone is in sales no matter where you sit in the org chart. So I thought that was a great quote to, to get us started and help us find some common ground as you know, we all have concern for the financial health of our businesses. Um, you know, we all wanna make it through this and hopefully come out stronger on the other side. So today we're gonna to talk about how each of us can play a part in reframing business development, finding new opportunities and supporting sales teams through a tough time. My name is Brianna Harper and I'm your webinar host. I'm also your resource for any questions you have uh, during the session or after the session. We plan about 45 minutes of content and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. So I'd love to answer your questions, hear how you're navigating. So please chat in anytime something comes to mind. After the session, I'll send out today's slide deck and a link to recording. If you have any questions, again, today, weeks from now, um, please reach out. You can email me at bharper.outmatch.com or find me on social at outmatchhcm. Uh, really quick before we begin, I wanna show you what's coming up in our Future of Work series. We actually started calling this the new Future of Work series because the future we were all planning for at the beginning of the year looks very different today than it did before. So a week from today, we're gonna have a public affairs expert on to talk about the $2 trillion stimulus that just passed. He's gonna help us understand what opportunities are available, who can take advantage, and how to make those decisions. Then on the 29th, we're gonna talk with leaders about how they're managing uncertainty while also being that calm center for others on their team. And finally, on May 13th, we'll begin looking at how to end furloughs and bring people back to work. So we don't know exactly when the return to work is gonna happen, but we know we need to start planning for it. So we're gonna to talk to HR and business leaders about how to do that. Um, I hope to see all of you back for our upcoming sessions. One last thing, today's session is valid for one professional development credit for the SHRM CP or the SHRM SCP. So look for that activity ID. I'll chat that out at the end of the webinar today. Our guests today all come from the world of Sandler training. Sandler, if you're not familiar, is the world's largest training organization. And they've helped over a million salespeople in sales mastery, sales management, leadership for organizational excellence and more. This is uh, from the Sandler website and I love this. Um, they say, while other sales training shows you how to play the game better, Sandler teaches you how to break the rules and change the game. So that's why I'm really excited to have these guests on with us today because not only are they experts in sales, they are also experts in thinking creatively about sales. So we've got 
Antonio from Miami, Florida. Hi, Antonio. Morning. Um, we've got Alana from Southfield, Michigan. Hi, Alana. Hi. And we've got uh, Matt from Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, Matt. Hi. Um, I'd love to hear each of you introduce yourself. So, Antonio, let's start with you. Okay, well, morning. I'm trying very hard not to sulk because you only have one of my books on the, on the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Moving beyond that, I'm, I'm trying to move beyond that. This probably wasn't the accent that you were expecting. Antonio Garrido out of Miami, I promise you this is me. I'm not a doppelganger standing in. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, so, yeah, so I, we, Clearly, I'm not from Miami, but we, we opened our office about um, six years ago. Uh, we love our clients dearly, and of course, some of the some of them are hurting right now. So we'll be talking about that, no doubt, today. And and typically, we work with companies who are maybe frustrated because they don't have the structure, the staff, the skills, the sales process to to reach their full potential. So we'll be touching on a few of those things as well today. And I think uh, if I was going to give the listener kind of something to bear in mind, uh, certainly as I talk, and maybe as, as the others talk as well. Um, Charles Darwin, another British author, <laughs> much more successful one than I, um, when he uh, wrote Origin of the Species, he talked about survival of the fittest. And we kind of think that survival of the fittest means you're the 800 pound gorilla in the space. And that's actually not what he meant. What he meant was those that can most adapt to change. And I think that today is, uh, hopefully we'll be, well, I certainly will be touching on um, how how well are we adapting to change because we're in, with that's that's our environment. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And thank you for the invitation, of course. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Antonio. Um, Alana, over to you. Uh, so nice to be here today. So um, as you said, I'm located in the Michigan area. So most people probably don't know where Southfield is. It's not as well known as Miami. So I'm going to say <laughs> we're in the Metro Detroit area. Um, we've been in the Sandler business for 27 years, one of the longest running Sandler franchises in the network. Um, we, as I said, are in the Metro Detroit area and just like Antonio, have a very diverse um, client base, anywhere from an individual salesperson looking to improve their own performance to a smaller, medium-sized business owner with a team to, you know, upwards to a large billion-plus organization. Um, and Antonio, you said it so well already. I guess the only thing I'll say a little bit differently, and I know you both you and Matt believe this as well, is, is we're really in the performance business. So we help our clients kind of challenge the status quo, stop, accept, uh, stop accepting mediocrity, um, and generate growth. So that's what we do. I'm very happy to be here today. Yeah, thank you, Alana. Matt, how about you? Yeah, nice to meet everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Butzer. So we've been part of the Sandler Network since 2015. Uh, we're based out of Madison, Wisconsin, and I think Antonio and Alana talked about, in general, what we do at Sandler very well, so I don't need to reiterate that. Um, but we work with kind of three core clients at Lyft, so we do a lot in the construction space. Um, so that is something that we're very familiar with. We do a lot in the manufacturing space and professional services space. Um, and I think Alana said it really well. We're in the performance business, so one of the misconceptions out there I think with Sandler is that we only do sales so I know we have a lot of HR leaders here uh, on the call today and we do a lot with HR we do a lot with leadership management training and development that's actually probably about 75 percent of our business at Lyft Consulting so I'm excited to talk to a bunch of HR leaders and uh, managers here today yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, the other face you see on your screen is Robin Stencil. She's going to be moderating the panel discussion today. So, Robin, would you tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Robin Stencil. I'm with Outmatch as the Chief Solutions Officer. Uh, and my focus is to work with our go-to-market teams. Um, and I, I come from a very traditional HR background over 20 years, um, leading talent for a large global manufacturing firm, large retail organization, and large uh, airline, uh, as I look at kind of my background, but um, really working with our team and thinking about kind of the sales perspective. So having a little bit of the HR hat on and a little bit of the sales side. So really excited um, to have this panel and be able to to talk about kind of the blend of those two things. Yeah, thank you, Robin. And thank you to all of you for being on the call. I know it's a crazy time and a busy time, so I'm excited to get us all together and, and talk through this.
Um, really quick before we get going, I want to do a quick poll. So let me get the correct slide up here. Um, all right, so this actually came from a recent article. Um, Al Campa, who's the former CMO of Taleo, which is an African tracking system, he said, um, your go-to market engine will never get a tougher test than right now. So I thought that was really interesting and I thought that was a great way to set up the conversation for us today. So I'm gonna launch this poll and you guys can tell us you know, where you're feeling the most strain, where you're feeling the most pain right now. All right, that is launched. If you guys will just take a couple seconds to get your answers in and that's gonna help us you know, understand where you guys are at and, and make the best use of our time today. All right, I see answers coming in. It looks like leading the pack right now is um, B, our customers are spending less. So if you haven't put in your answer yet, uh, throw that in quickly and then we'll move on. Okay, I'm going to share these answers. Um, yeah, so most of us on the call today are seeing, you know, the most strain in that customers are spending less. Is that what, um, Robin, or you guys on the panel, is that what you guys were expecting to see? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly as, as we think about it, um, you know, closely kind of follow those they aren't spending, but I think just in general, people have some things that they've got to keep in their supply chain. And so there is spending going on, just maybe a little bit more conservative is what I've been hearing as we've gone out and talked to different customers. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you everybody for participating in that poll with us. I'm gonna close this down and then hand it over to you, Robin, for our panel discussion Great. today. Thanks. Um, I think- So as we think about the poll results, um, and we think maybe about this this first question. Um, so how do you you know manage sales performance when no one's spending, or as we heard, spending less? And and Tony, I'm going to um, kind of take this to you for a second. You know, Brianna and I were preparing for this, and she said, you know, I talked to Antonio, and he did not like the title of our webinar. Um, he said, you know, in his expert expertise, people are spending. Um, and really it's about kind of where are they? So we thought maybe you could shed some light on where you're seeing and how you're seeing teams being impacted and kind of where they, you know, that pivot, that change. How do you kind of get to that point to say, if they are spending, where is it? How do I go find them? How do I manage that? <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, thanks for that. Uh, no, I didn't like <laughs> the topic of today's uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I'll explain why. Um, I think so. Imagine the world right now, and you know, <laughs> it could change the game. But right now, we, we're seeing, and certainly in, in our business, you know, clients and prospects fall into one of three buckets, right? Um, so it is a mixed bag. I get that entirely, but but we're actually feeling um uh, uh movement in all of these three buckets so let's take bucket one <laughs> i'm not entirely sure how how else to call it but so so there's there there are certain businesses and there are an enormous number of businesses whose business right now is growing almost exponentially i mean it's not that they're not spending <laughs> they just their business is going through the roof they are the busiest they have ever been Typically, we're seeing it in very uh, in, in very discrete verticals, right? So there are, uh, if you're in quote unquote critical infrastructure, right, then um, then your business is 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 tending to do rather well right now during during this period of time. So, for example, food packaging companies, you know, we all going to, we're all going to the supermarkets and the shelves are emptying as quickly as they're filling, right? Uh, those guys are busier than they have ever been. Uh, industrial cleaning, those guys where typically they were going in and maybe cleaning a place maybe once a month or once a week, now they're cleaning them every couple of hours, right? Um, toilet paper manufacturers, and I only use that just as a, just as an example that um, there are industries, there are verticals, there are sectors that right now 
uh, their issue is they're creaking at the seams. They're actually struggling to keep up. They have issues around people, finding people. They have issues around quality, it's customer service. Those guys are, 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 are desperately running just to try and keep up, okay? And they're working 24 seven as well. Some of my cl uh, customers are, are, are working around the clock right now and sometimes in very small teams because they can only have 25% of people in the manufacturing unit at any time. So, so this environment as, as we find ourselves in right now is giving them very unique challenges. So some people's challenges is not my customers aren't spending. Uh, some some are, some challenges are we can't keep up with business. So there's that as a bucket, right? So so let's call that a critical infrastructure bucket. And there are millions of those, right? And it could be from a roofer. Could be if if you need a roof repair, you know, it's not just medical distribution, you know, medical products distribution. If you're a roofer or an HVAC guy, um, you're probably busier now than you have ever been. And if you're not, then <laughs> then something's going terribly wrong somewhere with your uh, marketing and promotion, I would say. Then there's bucket two, right, which is sort of flat into some decline anywhere from, let's say, 10 to 50 percent. So, so those chaps in bucket two, they have different issues from bucket one. Um, it sounds rather contrived, and, and as I was writing this out for a client of ours and considering it and discussing it, it, it starts with lots of P's, and I, I don't like things that always look so contrived. However, it's it's what is actually happening. So those companies in Book It Two, um, they are looking to protect, in other words, protect what they've got, batten down the hatches, uh, save cash, right? And so 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 you know maybe they're not spending as much as they would. So it's about protecting. It's about pivoting, perhaps. What can we do to change our delivery model? What can we do to get into other markets? Maybe even that's only sort of guerrilla activity, or maybe partnering with other people. So it's protect, pivot, prioritize. That's we're going to have to cut some things and expand some other things, right? It's people and processes. And if there's HR people, if there are HR people listening today, they understand all about people and processes, right? It's promotion, how we marketing, because all of our marketing messages are going to have to change. And and then it's performance, right? So like Alana, some of you know, most of our clients are pretty uh, sizable clients that we do go down to uh, solopreneurs as well. And I remember it seems like an age ago, but really it wasn't, it was Q4 last year, and everybody was putting their business plans together for this year, right? Uh, and and whose business plan is now current? Nobody's, right? Everyone's <laughs> thrown their business plans out of the, uh, 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 out of the window because, because everything, you're in this period of uh, enormous change. Let's just go to the third bucket and then talk about uh, what that means for us. Then the third bucket are, um those in it's a terrible expression i didn't invent it. it's a marketing term but catastrophic terminal decline there are some companies whose business maybe um maybe in food service industry perhaps maybe you know restaurant businesses and, and and there are there are millions of them right um those businesses have gone from maybe a steady state of doing okay to now uh, absolute zero, and they've not just fur furloughed people, they've actually got rid of people. So um, it's a hugely dynamic world um, in each of those three buckets, right? And there are people um, flooding the market looking for, for, for jobs. There are people that, uh, 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 do I have one more minute just to describe one more thing? Yeah, yeah. Running out of time. Okay, yeah. so, um, uh, so, there's, there is a place called Top Gun, right? It's not just the movie. There is actually a place called Top Gun where they go and train uh, the best pilots in the world. Well, actually, and that's not true. They're already the best pilots in the world. You don't get to Top Gun unless you are the kind of creme de la creme, the very, very, the very, very top of, of your field. So what can they possibly train those chaps who already know how to fly planes. So they're not teaching them to fly planes because they already know how to fly planes. They fly planes better than anybody else on the planet. Well, they teach them, they teach them to deal with an environment that's filled with VUCA, right? V-U-C-C-A. And, and, and what that stands for is that they, they train them to deal with an environment that's volatile, well, tick, 
because we've got some of that that we're dealing with. Um, uncertain, okay, we're gonna take that too. Um, changeable, yeah, okay, that applies. Chaotic and ambiguous, right? So that's where we're all in right now. We're in this, we're in this environment, this VUCA-based environment. So what do they teach people in Top Gun that we could maybe apply to our world right now? Well, it comes back to that business planning thing I was talking about earlier. The, there is no such thing now as a six month timeline. There's no such thing as a six month horizon. What do they actually teach those people when they're uh, a, a top gun? They, it's not about thinking six hours ahead or six days ahead or six minutes. It's like six seconds ahead. And I know we don't have to think six seconds ahead, but our timelines have now come super, super condensed and crushed. And maybe later on, we'll talk about well, where do we prioritize our time, depending on which bucket we're in? How do we prioritize our sales? What should we do if we're a sales team in bucket one? What should we do if we're a sales team in bucket two? What should we do if we're a management team in bucket three? So um, I just kind of like, that will set it up, but not everyone isn't spending, is my point. Yeah, no, that's good. And you know, it's interesting that you you kind of brought up this uh, VUCA or VUCA world. Um, you know, I think the Institute of the Future has written some leadership competencies and saying this is what we can see. And at the time that they were writing this, right, the future was a little further out, but really starting to build those capabilities. I think to your point, if you've built those capabilities, your ability to pivot and move quickly um, probably really helps here along the way. Um, so interesting, um, just as you brought that terminology up, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to go pull that book back out again because it, it did talk about this from a future perspective. So very cool. good. Um, so now we're going to talk about how to pivot sales performance um, when different people are spending. So we've changed the, the title and the, the face of this as we kind of move forward. Um, so let's think about then as, as we change that, what are some tips that we might think about um, and I think one of those really comes around attitude and, and mindset. And, you know, Alana, you talked about, hey, we are not in the sales business necessarily. We're in the performance business. So as you think about um, kind of where we are and as you think about sort of Sandler and, you know, I felt uh, feel very fortunate to have gone through the training of last year. And what really kind of struck me is it's about sort of attitude and mindset. And so can maybe you can share with us how do people who are sitting in this position who might feel overwhelmed because maybe they haven't sort of categorized this in these nice buckets like Antonio has and they're just sort of seeing buckets two and three taking over and maybe not as opportunistically as bucket one. But how do people sort of, you know, get up every day, get in that mindset to go and sort of uh, begin to think about how to be successful in these times? Thanks, Robin. Um, obviously, our, our attitudes and our mindset are so important. And whether we realize it or not, our attitudes and mindsets then help us shape some beliefs, which then directly results in what action we will take or we won't take. So the environment that we're in right now, the media, all the messaging that we're hearing right now, if you turn the TV on or the radio on, is very negative, is very fear-driven. Um, and is very uncertain. I mean, none of us know when this is going to end, which is obviously, I think, for most people, the most challenging thing about the environment. If I just knew exactly when it was going to end, then I could plan. So this uncertainty and fear of the unknown um, can be paralyzing. And it can start us specifically in sales to start have some beliefs that might sound like, um, I can't, nobody wants to take my call right now. And just like we started the meeting earlier, right? Nobody's spending. Well, we just learned um, some great buckets and examples from Antonio that that's not necessarily true. Um, they are spending maybe more conservatively or more differently, or some are spending more based on what bucket that they're in. Um, but our belief that nobody's spending will then result in me maybe probably not even taking action to try to have any conversations with people. We could also have beliefs that I just need to hunker down. I just need to hunker down and, and it'll pass. Everybody keeps saying it'll pass. I need to hunker down, which to me means I need to take less action when the reality is, is our sales teams and us as leaders need to be taking even more action, um, doubling or tripling our activity level than what it was about a month ago. Um, so it has to do with, are we looking at things from an opportunity of limitation, which the media wants us to, and which is naturally how we're going to handle fear, or are we looking at things from an outlook of possibility um, and opportunity? 
and and we've heard a lot of examples and you can see a large manufacturing companies like obviously i'm from detroit so what gm is doing and what ford's doing to pivot manufacturing and be able to make all this ppe and retool to do all that is fantastic right so what kind of new opportunities now present themselves as a result of what's going on so looking at things from a mindset and outlook of opportunity so if i have an opportunity of of um, possibility and then my beliefs now go to you know what the reality is is my customers and my prospects are far more accessible than they have ever been before we have seen this by every single client and even our own internal team the availability of our customers and prospects is so much higher. They're spending more time with us on our phone. We're not ending up in voicemail jail because most of them are remote. They have more time, so they're more available than they've ever been before. Uh, we also have to have the belief that now is the time to add value for them. What can I do to add value to my customers, whether it's helping give some stuff away for free, like you're seeing all the webinars that are out there, and just like the one today, to be a resource to people. How can I connect them with other people in my network and help be a resource in other areas? So how can I really add that value? Um, it's really important um, that we have that mindset. Also, now's the time to differentiate against our competition. Now is not the time to hunker down. So how can I differentiate? And we differentiate by our actions. And some of our competition is in hunker down mode, is in that protect and doesn't know how to pivot mode. So how am I capitalizing on that opportunity? As a leader, now is your opportunity to up your leadership game. I know I've had to up mine in the last month and completely pivoted the way that I've been managing the team. It also allows us to have the opportunity to what I would say work on the business versus in the business. When we're so busy being reactive and putting out fires, now's the opportunity. Okay, so how do I look at new opportunities? How do I change my strategy? What are the processes that I've been saying forever that need to get documented and defined that maybe aren't, that now our people have the opportunity to work on the business, document some best practices, and even the HR folks, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about how does this affect us, our readiness to be hiring again, because that's gonna happen, and being able to look at the people that we had on the team or need on the team. So working on the business instead of in the business, but it all comes down to what's our opportunity What's our mindset? Is it of limitation or opportunity? And given I'm from Detroit, one of my favorite quotes um, that I think really does a good job of illustrating this is Henry Ford um, said, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, either way you're right. So it's up to us to create that mindset and belief that we can. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, it's interesting. You brought up a couple of different things. I think, um, you know, really this, do you hunker down or do you really start to focus and take more action? Um, you know, I uh, sat on a panel before all this started and we talked about the fact, like, what happens if a recession's coming? And interestingly, I was sitting next to someone who um, leads a large accounting firm and he said, in that time, you need to put your dollars again this is an accountant said put your dollars in marketing this is where you're going to come out because those people who can really start to build that case now as you start to come through will be those that sort of there those who kind of hunker down to your point and who aren't showing up may not be around and may not survive if you can't do that now certainly you've got to have some funds to be able to do that um, so if you're in bucket three that could be a little bit harder but when you can how do you do that the other thing I really liked that you said was this focus on the business, right? We were having this conversation this morning, a couple of us, of there's so many things that happen that we're always too busy to do. And how do we take that time and get those processes? And you know, to your point, how do we come out of this and be really clean and really crisp and really kind of accelerate that growth even further than what we might have if we just came out doing the same things we did before we went in here? So lots of great points. Gosh, could spend a ton of time just talking about that, but appreciate thinking about that. Um, I think the next thing then as we think about sort of the next tip is uh, tip number two, which is finding a new way to to operate. And Matt, um, you know, you've been hearing from people, I guess, that my, my business isn't going to make it. Um, you know, we can't do business the way we've always done. And I think, you know, we've both heard this from Antonio and Alana that that's not going to work if you try and do that. Um, how have you been helping people or how have you helped kind of look at this new way and to operate in a crisis? And what advice would you give people who are overwhelmed as they think about um, the slump or they're overwhelmed and not knowing where to go? What's sort of that, that advice to give leaders who are managing kind of through these situations? 
Sure, you bet. Can you hear me okay, Robin? Yeah. Yep. I was having audio problems before, so okay, great. Uh, well, I, I think the first thing I want to kind of dovetail off of what Alana talked about, which is this belief mindset. And as a leader, if we're talking about we have a sales team or we have a business development team underneath us, I think it's an opportunity for us to really test the belief system of our employees as well. And, and here's what I mean by that, which is that I think there are a lot of people that we talk about this concept at Sandler called head trash, right? And we have this we have this belief system that, hey, people don't want to hear from us, Alana and I'm Tony already talked about it, that now is not the opportune time. But I firmly believe, first and foremost, if you believe in your product and solution, you really believe that it helps people, it solves problems, whether or not they know they have those problems or not, then you're doing them a disservice if you don't reach out to them in this time of turmoil. And so as a leader, I would really test the belief system of your employees to help them reassess, do they believe in your product or service to begin with? Because there's a good chance that some of them may not to the degree that they should. And those that really do, those are the people that will perform. Um, so that's that's the first point. Uh, the next point, just a, more of just a general leadership concept, we're all going through change right now. And I know it's easy. I myself struggle with my team at times with when we're going through change. Patience. Patience is something I really struggle with. I'm a high D on the disc personality style. Um, therefore, patience is not my virtue. Uh, but I think if we can contextualize change in a framework, it makes it easier for us to deal with it. And so when I talk about the five steps of change, I really talk about shock is the number one thing. I think when all of us were told that, hey, you're gonna be forced to work from home, we went through this initial shock moment where it was just totally disrupting our world. Then the next stage is denial. While we're denying that this is happening, it felt really surreal. Then resistance, well, I don't wanna work from home. I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna prospect. It's not the right time. Then finally, we get into the exploration phase where we start to think about, okay, how can my world be different? How can I thrive in this environment and not just survive? And then lastly, commitment. As a leader, if we don't recognize these stages of change with our employees, it can be very easy for us to approach the employee and say, hey, how come you're not working? How come you're not making your calls? How come you're not doing your prospecting behaviors? How come you're not getting this project done? And if they're in one of the first three stages, in my own personal opinion, if we're trying to lead them to water, they're not going to drink. We need to get them to lead themselves to water through coaching them, through helping them explore by asking them in-depth questions to help them kind of sort out their own shock, denial, or resistance. It's only when they actually get to true exploration that we'll actually be able to coach, train, and develop them through this process. So my my real recommendation there is really take inventory of employees and identify where they're at in the stages of change. We all sit and camp out in each stage for a different duration. There's no uniform approach to it. One person may go through shock, denial, and resistance in a day. Other people may take two weeks. And we're seeing that not only with our employees, but we're also seeing with our clients. I had a client day one called me up and said, Matt, we want to hit the pause button in our relationship. Two weeks later, he called me up and he said, Matt, we're going to double down, right? He was in shock, denial, and resistance. Now he's finally in exploration and commitment. So think about it through both lenses with your employees and then your clients as well. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think as you talked about this, you know, kind of early as you were talking about the belief system that, you know, people, do I believe that I've got the right solutions for people to have? It makes me think about um, a founder from a large retailer once saying, it is, um, it is your moral imperative to sell people something that they don't know they need yet, right? And that's sort of that, that belief and kind of getting people into that mindset because in this particular retailer, they sold a bunch of stuff that you had no idea you needed, but every time you go into the store, you're like, oh, of course I need this gadget, this gadget or this thing. So really that belief becomes very important. That's great, thanks for sharing that. And I love kind of as you walked us through sort of that change model, as we think about kind of where we've been in this conversation, we've got businesses in the different stages that they're going in. If you layer on sort of these change stages, right, you're starting to kind of complete the picture for everyone, which is great. So as we think kind of about um, what's next, um, and, and Alana, as you think about this um, and kind of resetting expectations in the current situation, um, we wanna look at sort of the future as well. What's your advice 
um, to businesses on how they can prepare to come out of this crisis. So how do you start to think about getting ahead? You mentioned sort of focusing on the business. How do we do that? So as we come out of this, we can start to get ahead. You mentioned, you know, we're talking a little bit about how do we start to think about hiring again, talent, what's a good plan to have in place, you know, now to help you, you know, be ahead of the curve when things start to change? Um, thanks, Robin. Great question. Um, so I think it starts with kind of Antonio said, whatever our business plan was to start the year is out the window. Um, so we've got to reevaluate the plan. So what is our plan for this year? What is the plan for the next six months for the balance of 2020 and beyond? So making sure we really clearly define what our goals and plans are. And for most of us, the plan is gonna be if we're gonna come back out of this and we're gonna have to hire people again or bring back the people that we had. And now's the time for them to look at really what are the positions, the critical positions that I need in my organization independent of the people that they maybe have or had. Because a lot of mistakes we see is, as organizations grow and change and um, people evolve, their roles evolve, and we end up having people doing three different things or their role has changed. And we've never really taken a look at what positions do I truly need in the organization to meet those new goals that I've come up with and try to be independent of the people that you either have or had, right? And in those positions, what are the key roles, responsibilities, and KPIs required for those different positions. Because now's the time for you to refresh that job description. Most of us, that's on the list of things that we know we need to do, and I'm sure HR, you're very well aware of this, right? Um, but now's the time to refresh the job description for the new position that has probably shifted coming back out of this because we're now having the opportunity to maybe right size a little more effectively than we could before or maybe our strategy has changed and we need different positions than we had before so being able to refresh those positions clearly well defined um, and the, the job descriptions that go with it with the thought of now who's the person that I need to fit into that position. So at Sandler we have what we call kind of a search model and we try to define who it is that we're looking for for specific roles. I'll go through it real quick um, but what are the skills that the people need? What is the experience that's required that they have had previously? What are the attitudes, back to that attitudes, um, that they need to possess and have? What are the previous results that they should have been able to demonstrate? What are the cognitive abilities? So obviously, how do they think? How do they need to think? So some of the cognitive abilities, as well as the habits, H stands for habits. So we like that acronym because it really makes us think through a little more defined how we need really truly the people that we need on our team. And now is the opportunity for us to be able to better define that. It's also opportunity to relook at our hiring process and our screening process. What's broken there that we need to fix so that we can interview better? Um, most of you, I would hope, are using some sort of assessment um, as part of your hiring process. So you have objective data on these candidates as they come in so that you can hire and interview stronger um, because we're going to have an opposite situation than what we had a month ago. A month ago, we had record low unemployment. Coming out of this, it's going to be record high unemployment. So there's going to be more people available than ever before, but it's going to be even more important for us to figure out, okay, who's the A players that are available and who are the C players that are, are available because I want to stay away from those C players and now there should be more availability of those A players than there ever were before. So now's the time, especially for all the HR folks that are on the call today, um, really should be thinking through as I come out of this, what do I need different in my organization? Same goes for the processes um, and structure in the organization. Um, we've probably all made some changes. I know I have in my leadership approach and even how often our team gets together and what projects we're working on and how do we maintain that momentum coming back out of here and just don't go back to our old ways because life is quote unquote normal. It's not going to be the same normal it was a month ago. It is going to be a new normal. So we've got to be thinking through um, how we're going to handle that when we come out of this. Yeah, I like as you kind of talked about, you know, sort of looking at it, what is it you need, what's different, and then how are you assessing against 
what's different, right? Because if you use, you change your, you know, what you're looking for, but use your same assessment strategy, you probably aren't going to come up with the, with the best answer. And, and I wonder too, you know, I think it's kind of thinking about this, if we take sort of that VUCA or VACA that, that Antonio talked about and you apply that, right? So how do I think about this new normal and think about those capabilities that I'm going to need coming out of it starts to shift again too you know, where we start to look and have that. So great, kind of a great themes of stories as you all are starting to pull these together for us. So that's, that's really good. Um, so Antonio, then I'm gonna kind of flip it to you. So now we've gone through and, and we've got either our team that's here, maybe we've, you know, through some organizations that are in that first bucket that you talked about, maybe they're even bringing new people on board. Um, but as people start to think and start to draw parallels about what's happening, you hear a little bit of, you know, recession in 2008, some of the things that happened in 9-11. And there's a lot of things that are different about this, um, but there are some things that, that are similar too. So as you think about this, how might you coach someone who's maybe never been through a change? So those new people who are newer to um, the workforce who maybe didn't experience that change, how might you coach them? And then how might you also coach those people who did experience 2008 or they experienced 9-11 and have again sort of this preconceived notion what are the similarities what are the differences as you start to coach those folks okay great question i am um, i ran um, a session just for leaders last thursday for a couple of hundred leaders and um i asked for a show of hands i said you know the world this book right the world is super changeable it's just like one day there's just no blueprint anymore um, which upsets a lot of people, and I understand that, right? Um, and I, I said, of a show of hands, who wishes things were as they were, you know, like three, four weeks ago? Because three or four weeks ago, it was a completely different world, right? So all leaders, show of hands, who wishes things were like they were three or four weeks ago? And, and I, we didn't take a, a statistic, but most people put their hands up and said, yes, please, three or four weeks ago would be terrific. Right. So that would be great. Can we go back to three or four weeks ago? OK, so the first thing we have to accept is no, we can't because nothing ever does. Nothing ever went back to us because things change always. Going back to what Matthew was saying, nothing ever goes back to how it was. So things didn't go back to how they were after 9-11. They didn't go back to how they were after JFK got shot. They didn't go back to how they were after the last stock market crash or the Vietnam War or and 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 because things never go back to where they are. So I think the first thing we have to accept is that, right? So come back to what Matthew was saying, just accept that, you know, we're in a new world. And, and, and you know, uh, this sounds dreadful, but sucking our thumb and hoping, you know, wishing that things were better uh, as they were is, is never a good strategy. Neither is hope a good strategy, right? So um, I'm a very pragmatic individual. Uh, I, I like lists, I like, I like to, I like top tens, right? What are the top What are the top ten things I should be doing right now? And if you're a salesperson, doesn't you know in bucket one or bucket two? If you're a, a leader in bucket one or bucket two, and if you're a, a manager, you know what should what what should we what should we be doing? So um, in that, the world is so so compressed right now with all of this VUCA volatility, uncertainty, chaos, uh, change, and uh, 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 and ambiguity. That all of our all of our attention should be is now it's not six years or six months in in advance it's very very short interval thinking so that that requires short interval control so I think the first thing I would say to people um, is um, yeah things you know it's a new normal what's the future going to look like nobody knows if anybody does know that uh, if you could email me next week's lottery numbers that'd be terrific so so we don't know what um, what the future's going to look like but then we never do so the, at sandler we have a thing that we talk about behavior attitudes and technique and when you were talking about coaching when we're talking about coaching what we're actually talking about is working on the attitude side of people's um, um, success model, if you like, because coaching deals with with attitudinal pieces. Well, one of the best ways to get people's attitude right is is um, lots of behaviors. So good behaviors lead to good attitude. A nice way to think about it is positive motion leads to positive emotion, right? Because if you've just spent all day binge watching Tiger King on Netflix and eating chocolate ice cream, 
by the time the evening comes by, you're going to think, well, that was a day wasted, right? But if you're super busy and if managers are giving very short interval controls, I'll explain what that looks like in a second, and, and giving people lots and lots and lots and lots of things to do that are useful things, not pointless things. Like, so, so could I give you just a couple of examples? Would that be worthwhile? Yeah. So, so one of the first things we said to all of our companies, whichever book, it, you know, perhaps that you're in is the first thing you've got to do. Everybody knows clean your hands. Right. As soon as you've cleaned your hands, clean your pipelines. Right. So get all of your pipelines entirely up to date. Understand what pieces of business, if any, are going to be coming over the hill and when they're going to be coming over the hill. So. You know, the most important thing I think that any for any leadership team to deal with is reality, right? Uh, not hope, not not you know promises and all of that kind of stuff. So so let's first of all figure out what's real. So clean our pipelines, and it's super easy. You just call people and you say, "You still open? We're still open. I'm, I've been given the job of checking out all of my projects and my CRM." I had ABC project as 80% of closing within the next three weeks. I don't suppose that's true now, is it? When you know what's the what's the new reality, right? So so face that. So make sure that everybody's facing reality. You know, there's now time that nobody's traveling. We've got so much more time to do things that we never had time to do. If you're going to come, if you don't come out of this crisis stronger, faster, leaner, meaner, better trained, with a better uh, with a cleaner pipeline, with more clarity, then your issue was never that you lacked time, it was that you lacked de determination to get these things done, right? So for, for, the leaders, for the leaders on there, right, be very prescriptive. Here's what we want our people to be doing, cleaning out your pipeline, and uh, an hour a day on LinkedIn. Have we all noticed how much, how many more messages and connections we're all getting on LinkedIn? I'm getting hundreds every day. Right, which is terrific. So long as you're not just going on the Alice in Wonderland black hole of LinkedIn, which is kind of, you know, Facebook for adults. Forgive me, Mr. Zuckerberg and, and us. So, um, so, so make sure that the the we we have a model at, um, and I'll finish in a second. But we have a model at Sandler, which is which is called our care model, which is what are the behaviours that we have to do? What are the strategies that we have to adopt? to keep certain strategic accounts. Whichever bucket you're in, make sure that the business that, that you need to keep, you're going to keep. And that doesn't mean cross your fingers and light a candle and say a prayer. It means actually what is the plan that we're going to adopt that such that we're going to keep this amount of business. And then we've got to think about attain, just as Alana said. People are home now. It's easy to get hold of people. So what business are we going to go out for? Go and get, right? So we need an attain plan. Uh, regain. Talk to everybody. I sent an email to um, a couple of hundred people that I've been that have been prospects or ex clients of ours over the last six years. Now's the time to connect with all of those. Maybe some of those will come back to you, and then expand. Maybe then that you've got some business, and right now is the time you can go wider and deeper. So the other thing is that the sales managers. Um, needs to do lots of ride-alongs now, lots and lots of them, two or three a day. If anybody wants, and I can send it to you, Robin, or whatever, we, we've got like a plan for managers. What do they do in the morning? What do they do at lunch? What do they do in the afternoon? What do they do in the evening? Make a very, very busy plan. Keep you guys really well connected with Zoom and all of that kind of stuff. Lots of attaboys, short interval control, lots of sales accountability, and lots of behaviors. The end. That's really great. And I think it really sort of ties into, as we think about kind of our next and maybe getting close to our last questions here, I'm going to make several Matt. But, you know, um, you know, Matt, as, as Antonio talked about this care model, you know, I, I heard him talk about determination or even kind of focus as you think about how you move forward and then this planning piece. So we know that structure is really important to people. It becomes even more important in these times where we could, I guess, theoretically be sitting and watching Tiger King all day versus kind of sitting at our computers and doing the work that we have in front of us because we don't, if we, especially we don't have that structure. Can you tell us a little bit maybe about the Sandler way of establishing structure um, and how do you adapt that in a virtual environment? You bet. And, and I must confess, I have watched Tiger King, but it was a productive use of time. It was that night. <laughs> uh, I did on Sunday, no, so yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, we, we can talk about structure. So, you know, I, I think one of the things that, you know, we were dealing with a, a month ago is that most 
salespeople specifically, you, you'd often hear from them, look, I'm too busy. I can't even I can't even take time to plan right now because I'm so busy. There is no time to plan. Now we have the opposite effect, right? We have an, enough time, more people should have more time. So now is the time to plan. And so what I specifically mean by that for your employees and if you're a leader on the call today is make sure that you're coaching your employees on how to time block. Uh, make sure you're coaching your employees on how to identify what's the one thing, the most important thing that makes everything else meaningless or unnecessary. There's a great uh, business book called The One Thing that Gary Keller wrote, um, number one real estate company in the world. And he talked about identifying the one, the most important thing that we should focus on. And I think as people in general, we get really ingrained in the minutia. We focus on everything and then we beat ourselves up when we don't accomplish everything that we planned. When the reality is we each probably have one most important thing that we should be doing every single day. For salespeople, generally speaking, that's prospecting. That's, that's going out and finding new work so that you have a full pipeline. And so if you're not time blocking, if you're actually not putting an hour, two hours, three hours in your in your calendar every single day to do that on a routine basis, you're not doing yourself a very good service. So making sure that you identify that is really important. Um, the other thing is just taking time to really slow down and set yourself up for success. Journaling can help you do that. That's a way for me. I do it every single day. I journal. I journal about the things that I want to accomplish for the day. I journal about the previous day, about what, what was the success, how I defined it, what lessons I took out of that. I journal about the attitude that I want to have. So if I wake up in the morning and I have a bad attitude, I rewrite my mental scripts that Alana talked about. Whereas I might say, hey, look, I really don't want to prospect today. I'll rewrite it. I'll say, no, I am going to prospect because I know it works and it's going to put me in a better frame of mind. Um, so taking time to journal makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, one last thing, because I know we're running short on time today, I would say is just, you know, tailor and temper your expectations for your employees, but inspect what you expect with them um, and, and make sure that you... When I talk about, about tempering your expectations, you know, I'm at home right now. I have twin daughters. I have a wife who works full time. I work full time. There's a lot of stress on people right now working from home. So temper your expectations and help coach your employees through how to work in sprints. There's this great methodology. Most of you probably know it's called agile methodology. It's used a lot in web application, mobile application. It talks about having a definitive period of time to get certain goals and objectives accomplished. We can do the same thing with our day. It's very daunting to think about prospecting the entire day or managing client relationships the entire day. But if you set your day up for success, you manage your time with your family, you say, hey, look, for this two hour block, I really can't be interrupted. It's my one most important thing. I need to prospect. And you can get that ability to do that. Then you should mark that day as a success, whether or not the rest of the six hours of the day you accomplish what you want to or not. As long as you got that one thing done, that's all that really matters. I like that, and particularly that that one thing, because you're right, especially during this time, um, I find myself with these super long lists of all these ambitious goals because I'm here, so what else am I going to do, right? If I do these things during the day and I do the, all this work thing, then what are the other things I'm, I'm going to go get done? And what I'm finding is the end of the day, I'm not checking all those things off the list because it really became too much noise. So I love that kind of, if, you, if you've got the list maybe, but what are the one thing that you, and how do you look at success? Really important and a, and a great way to kind of, I guess, turn us over to some, some questions we might have, Brianna. Yeah, absolutely. So I love, Matt, what you just said was not about being in a physical office or being at home. It was just about bringing structure to your, to your day, regardless of what that work environment looks like. So it's a perfect way to adapt and be agile, no matter where we all are today and where we might be in a month or two. Um, I do have some questions here. Um, so I got a question from Joseph, just about how do we create sustainability in sales performance? Um, and he is in the banking sector. So I know we talked a lot about, you know, what's the new normal? Um, we're not really going to go back to what it was before. And we've got this, this moment in time where we're managing crisis, and then we're going to try and create the new normal, a new sustainability. Um, and I think we've talked about some ways to do that already, but is there anything else that you guys would add on creating sustainability in sales performance? Or, you know, we even, as we were pulling this together, we talked about resetting expectations and defining the win differently. So, so can we talk about that for a moment? 
can I make it's Antonio may I make a comment on that and um, I've been itching to uh, contrary view to the one that Robin gave about 15 minutes ago when Robin said he should be spending your money on marketing. Uh, I, I entirely 100% disagree. I think you should be spending your money on sales training and I'm not saying that just because of what we do for a living. <laughs> no, genuinely. But the thing about in terms of um, um, in, in embedded embedding um, a sales process that will allow you you know give you quality control of your sales process and allow you whether you're growing or shrinking to guarantee that that every opportunity is capitalized upon so if i were going to be spending any money now um i would be spent you know if if you're in bucket two perhaps in bucket three where the opportunities are much fewer than they used to be then it's incumbent upon the leaders and the management team to, to know that the conversion rate of that is going to be as high as its maximum potential. And 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 I think now, as was Matt was saying, now we're all working from home. We have time to train our people. So I would say, uh, and it doesn't have to be our process, right? Because I was the best, but that's not what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. so so make sure that the, the whole of the sales function and the management team are following a sustainable, repeatable. Um, really soup to nuts uh, sales process. Now is the time to train them on that. Yeah, Thanks. Matt or Alana, is there anything you would add to that? I think it's- One quick- Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll just be real quick. Yeah, just one quick comment to kind of attack onto that from a sustainability standpoint. I think we all see it a lot, Antonio and myself, we see it a lot in salespeople specifically, which is the sprint methodology, but it's 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 also, hey, I do a lot of prospecting one day, a lot, I do a lot of outreach, and then my pipeline gets full, I stop prospecting, and then mm -hmm. I find myself at the bottom of the mountain looking back up saying, holy cow, that's a big, big hill to climb. And a lot of people are right there right now because all of a sudden their pipeline dried up and looking back at the mountain and thinking, man, I don't know if I have the energy to do that. And so there's this old thing that was this old story of fable that we all grew up with, with the tortoise and the hare, right? Well, mm -hmm. the tortoise won the race. And so I would say that sustainability, especially through banking, in my lens is just picking a small finite number of behaviors that you want to do on a consistent basis. Don't try to boil the ocean all in one bit. Just If I could just reach out to five people a day for a month, that'd be a heck of a lot more effective than reaching out to 20 people one day and waiting a week and then reaching out to 20 people the next day. So perhaps lower the goals a little bit to make sure that they are sustainable, but be consistent with it. Yeah. Alana, I see you nodding along with that. Um, before we run out of time, I want to get to our final thoughts quickly. We've got about two minutes left, so I'd love to leave the audience with um, each of you your final thought on the most impactful thing that HR can do to help sales teams. So if we could just go around, Alana, we can start with you. Um, sure. And your actually, thirty second takeaway. Sure, and it'll be a direct dovetail after what Matt just said. But basically, it's really important that we manage what we can control. There's a lot in our environment right now that we can't control. So we can control our activities and our behavior. So it's just what Matt said, making sure we've got dialed in the activities that we need our people to be doing and that we're measuring and managing against those as leaders. And we also can control our own thoughts. So being able to take a little time and self-reflection, just like Matt said he does through journaling, um, but being able to ask yourself, am I looking at this as a problem or an opportunity and what do I need to do to help my mindset, which will be then more support supportive of me doing my behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Alana. Antonio, what would you say is your final takeaway? So I always smile when someone says, can you can you just kind of leave us with one positive? And I, just to be contrary, I, can I give you two negatives? Because that'll make one positive. Go for it. So for the, uh, for the HR people listening, I think the first thing I'd say is don't you know, I, I know we're all in a in a in a in a uncertain world, including the HR people that are also listening to this, right? So, but 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 messaging and communication has to come from the top. So figure out how to how to communicate with people. Don't let them feel isolated, right? Because we're physically isolated. That doesn't mean we have to be emotionally or conceptually or or you know uh, 
we're structurally isolated, but we don't have to be isolated in terms of our core values. Um, I think that a lot of HR people say, hey, listen, I'm always here. My door is always open. If you need to talk to me, you know you know how to find me. And, and I'd like to change that to every conversation with our people, we should figure out how loaded they are on, on a scale of one to 10. How loaded are you right now? And how stressed are you right now on a scale of one to 10? Figure out loaded and stressed because that will give you that will give you a better idea of how to respond versus my door is always open. If you need to talk to me, then give me a shout because nobody does because it means that they've got to call someone and say, I'm struggling and I don't know what to do and I'm scared and no one's going to be brave enough to do that. So HR people ask everybody how loaded they are and how stressed they are. That's a great point. Um, Matt, what about you? Yeah, you know, I, I... Along that line, perhaps a little bit of a different angle from an HR perspective is really, I think now's the time to test your tolerances a little bit. And here's what I mean by that. On one hand, we talked about the stages of change and being respectful of that, but I'm sure Antonio and Alana hear it a lot. One of the most common frustrations I hear from our clients is, and I have all these salespeople and I feel like they're just really active and they're not productive. And I feel like I'm only getting production out of, you know, one or two out of 10. And the reality of Pareto's principle is real, right? I mean, 20% of people make up 80% of results. And so although we're going through change and we also need to be understanding of people, as an HR representative, I encourage you to really think about how tolerant you are to be. Um, because there's an opportunity to ensure that you're aligning yourself to the productive employees in your organization and that you're not too tolerant um, because we still have a business to run and we still have expectations that people have to meet. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad that all of you were able to join. Antonio, Alana, Matt, Robin, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that was on the call with us today. I hope to see you back for our next webinar. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Uh, thank you so much. Bye-bye.